Hi. It's nice to see you. Uh, tell us where you are right now. Uh, I'm in uh, Amman. Uh, wait just a second, because I'm in a room with a lot of people. Uh, guys, I'm doing live for Cold Pink now. You can say hi to them. Hi. <laughs> We're going to talk hi. about Palestine, so <laughs> be a little quiet, please. <laughs> so I'm in Amman. After they rejected me from the border, I went back to Amman and I'm staying here a couple more days until I go back to Sweden. Could you begin by just uh, telling us what happened at the border and then we'll go back and talk about your journey to the border? Yeah, I guess the same thing as for you, <laughs> like a long <laughs> interrogation. For me, it took six hours. I don't know how long they interrogated you, though. Seven hours. <laughs> Seven? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I had to do something bigger. We had to compete the most <laughs> hours of interrogation. <laughs> Interrogate you about if you could talk a little bit about what happened. Uh, they really wanted the names, they wanted places, they wanted to know exactly everything I was gonna do, who I was gonna meet, their telephone numbers if I could provide. Uh, obviously, I don't give the Israeli authorities names of Palestinians because that's like a one way ticket to jail for them, I figure. So, yeah, they would just keep pushing for that. And since I knew they were gonna reject me to begin with, I didn't really have any plans in Palestine, so I just told them I would go around as many places as possible for the whatever time frame you would allow me to be there. And they're like, no, we didn't walk here for 11 months just to not have a plan of what you're going to do there. I said, well, you don't really know me. But... <laughs> and uh, it's my understanding that they accused you of... Uh planning a, a protest, a demonstration yes. in, in Nabi Saleh. So they gave, me, they gave me two official reasons. Uh, like, I was falling asleep a lot because I was so tired <laughs> during the interrogation. And when they said they, like, bombard you with questions for, I don't know, an hour or two, and then they send you out, and then they take you in again and bombard you with questions. So when I'm out, I'm just falling asleep because I had walked for 12 hours that day in 40 degrees heat. And finally, they came out and said, like, you're not allowed entry into what they call Israel, occupied Palestine. And the two reasons were, one, they thought I was lying during the interrogation, which I was not, but they thought so. And two, that I was going to arrange a demonstration in Nabi Saleh, which is very, it's a weird accusation. Like, even if I was intending to do that, why would that be a reason for not allowing me into Palestine? They say they're a democracy, right? Well, demonstrations are allowed in democracies, as to my knowledge, but apparently they think that's too big a threat for them to arrange a demonstration. This wasn't even my intent. I honestly don't know where they got that idea from. They kept asking, are you going to visit this place? And I kept just replying yes to every place, because I don't know, probably every place if I have time. And uh, I, I know the village of Nabi Saleh well, and um, I, I know that the Tamimis uh, have been posting about seeing that yes, uh, you were accused they, of that. I'm wondering if you've had a chance to be in touch with them and... No, not really, but I think uh, I would contact them like pretty fast if they would let me in. Of course, I want to meet them. They are so brave. They are true heroes. And Jana Jihad also. I really want to meet her. <laughs> uh, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about, I know it was 11 months and I've seen the AJ Plus video, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your journey uh, to Palestine. Why, you, yeah. uh, why, you know, what your thoughts were. Um, choosing that journey and maybe some highlights. Sure. So the whole idea behind the journey is that uh, the world moves with pressure. Israel will not stop occupying Palestine just because uh, it suddenly wakes up one day and realizes that it's breaking international law and they're not respecting human rights. I mean, uh, they will stop because they will be pressured to stop. And pressure doesn't come by itself. It usually requires mass movements of millions of people demanding. But people don't just wake up one day and realize everything that's wrong about the world and start demanding justice. They need to be informed first. They need to have the awareness. And it requires a lot of organization and mobilization to inspire people to do something about all the injustices we have all around. So one way I figured to raise a lot of awareness would be by walking, because uh, the nature of it being difficult would just I don't know, motivate people to ask, like, why would this crazy guy walk so long? Like, that's a really weird thing to do. It's really hard. Why walking? So then I would get the chance to talk about the occupation in Palestine, all the human rights violations, and just the conversation would always come up, like, why am I doing it? And I would always try to engage as many people as possible in uh, what's happening over there and been happening the last uh, decennia. And uh, for the journey in itself, it's been so long, I don't know what to say. I've been walking in the snow in Bulgaria, in, in 
the last day took 12 hours in 40 degree heat in the Jordan Valley. I've been meeting amazing people. I've been alone for a long of the time also between cities and between villages. It's been really, really tough. Walking up and down mountains, walking in valleys, yeah, just everything. It's been such a long time. Wow. Um, you gave talks along the way, yes? Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of raising awareness. I try to organize lectures at universities, at organizations, wherever I could find a venue. You know. The most spontaneous one was at a bar in Croatia where I just told, <laughs> asked the bartender if I could use his huge flat screen TV to plug in my... Uh, I have a presentation about Palestine. So he turned down the music hey, and I started talking to the crowd about Palestine. It was, it was really fun. And we just gave a quick lecture about the human rights violations there. Kind of killed everyone's mood, but uh, there was good discussions afterwards because people were like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> and like, why is he talking about this? And oh, those pictures I haven't seen before. It was nice. You can always, like, you create your opportunities. You can talk as much as you want if you take the initiative and don't ask for permission and just go ahead. Just ask a little bit, but be very proactive. What kind of responses would you say you got from people that were not previously familiar with the issue? Do you feel like you changed hearts and minds along the way? Well, I certainly hope so, and I think so, but it's difficult. For most people, this information that we are sharing is completely new, and I respect the people not taking it as face value and just going and doing their own research. They shouldn't trust me, right? With everything I'm saying, they should go and do their research and see if what I'm saying is true or not. So hopefully I inspired some curiosity as for people to go and find out more about what's happening. And as soon as anyone starts reading human rights reports, they will see the ugly truth of occupation. So raising curiosity, I think, is really important. And I could tell that I touched uh, quite a few people also on the road. Um, I know that you've gotten quite a lot of, of media um, upon your denial, which is, is really fabulous and successful. I think that it you really reached out and um, Palestinians, I know, have responded with just real applause and gratitude to you for this opportunity to raise awareness. Yeah. <laughs> and I heard as well, you were even offered like an honorary citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I heard as well, but you know, I read it in the media as everyone else, not like I heard anything from the persons in charge. So I, I know it's been in the media a lot, but um, if you could give a message to folks on the ground in, in Palestine, to the Tamimis, and uh, to people in Ramallah, and Bethlehem, and Hebron, yeah. and everywhere, what would you like to say to them? What would have you like to say to them in person that um, instead... Uh... Well, uh, don't lose hope. The world is with you. And uh, nothing comes cheap and nothing is for free. We need to struggle to gain our rights everywhere all the time. Uh, the world doesn't change itself. It is changed by people. Palestine will not free itself. And in the end, it will be freed by the Palestinian people and not some Swedish guy, of course I will help as much as I can, but the work on the ground is what's going to be most important in the end. And like the first intifada, a mass movement of non-violent uh, resistance and mass boycotts, the Israeli forces were scared in their beds when the Palestinians uh, had their 18 cows in Beit Sahur and started producing their own milk. That's what's going to scare the occupation, you becoming self-sufficient and not relying on the occupation anymore for anything. And uh, as soon as you manage to really push that mass movement and starting to use the BDS as a tactic inside Palestine also, mass boycotts of the Israeli occupation until they become serious about uh, pursuing some sort of solution or some sort of peace. They have to be pressured into doing so, and the most powerful pressure is from inside Palestine, and we will do everything we can from outside to support and to help and to pressure our government to stop supporting the occupation while it lasts. Um, I know that my, my own story specifically, and then all the other stories of recent denials, Israel really seems to be uh, cracking down on solidarity activists and human rights advocates being able yeah. to uh, enter and stay in the country. Do you do you feel like um, our solidarity and our work on the ground with Palestinians um, is having that type of an impact that Israel is really afraid of this 
growing support across the world. Yeah, of course. I mean, why else would they react the way they are reacting? Why would they deny me entry if they didn't fear anything? Why would they deny you entry? Especially as a Jewish person, I mean, all their fallacies are just falling to the ground. It's not like they have anything to do with... They just keep mounting these excuses, but we keep proving them wrong when all we are seeking is peace and human rights, no matter who we are. And for me, as a non-religious Swedish person, like, why would they deny a human rights activist from Sweden from entering? It just proves our point that they have a lot to hide, that the ugly face of occupation prefers to stay hidden and continue its dirty business unnoticed. And when we expose the truth by just letting the Palestinians have a voice and trying to share their stories to the world, Israel starts reacting heavily, investing millions of dollars on tracking us, hacking our phones, countering our initiatives. It proves that it's working and that, it's, that it is activism that's going to have an impact. I mean, in the end, words are cheap, when, but when we start to do actions, they have to react. And every reaction is a proof that it, what we are doing is working. Um, do you have any plans for what's next? I, I, I imagine you must want some time off and uh, a little bit of time to rest. But do you have next plans for how you'll continue have, your advocacy? You know, 11 months on the road, you get a lot of ideas on what to do next. I have a lot of big projects in mind all human rights related. And uh, I'm going to make some sort of grand announcement <laughs> with a video about my next big project. But uh, in the near future, I'm just going to do speaking tours in as many countries as possible, go to the universities and try to speak about the occupation and the human rights violations. Like, you can contact every single school in every single country. That's a massive work. But I will try to get people to work on that with me and see whatever schools would have me come and talking about uh, my experience on the road and in Palestine and um, just about human rights and this region and how we can progress. Well, I know we at Code Pink would love to be a part of and support in whatever way we can. You I'm are actually coming to the US. That's one of my nearest plans. So I, for sure, we will meet there, I hope. Well, absolutely. So we're based in, uh, I work out of Washington, D.C., and we're based here in Washington, D.C., and we can't wait to, to see you here. And um, <laughs> yeah, both uh, we'd be thrilled to plan some speaking events, um, maybe to go around and uh, meet with offices in Congress and speak to them about your experience. That would be amazing. And... That would be really amazing. Let's do as so, much as we can. <laughs> yes, let, let's be in touch immediately. Um, I'll, I'll follow up with this to see when your plans to arrive are. And uh, we'd love to also uh, put you in, increase any contacts that you can use in the US uh, for all of that and to work with you in that way and in all of your next adventures. I'd really like to thank you for coming on with us. And we were speaking with uh, Benjamin, who was just denied entry at the Jordanian border as he tried to enter Palestine. Israel denied him entry, uh, saying that they were afraid he might uh, participate in a demonstration in the village of Nabi Saleh. He had walked for 11 months from Sweden to Palestine to raise awareness for Palestinian rights. And we're going to be continuing to follow what he does and to push back against uh, Israel's denial of entry to nonviolent human rights activists. I'm going to bring him back on for a moment to see if he has any last words for us before we end this video. Uh, Benjamin, I am adding you back in. Hi. Oh, hi Sorry again. about that. It got cut off for some reason. Yeah, I don't so know I what happened. Just going over again with, with people um, what happened on your journey and uh, how thrilled we are to be with you today. Um, but I want to know from you also what happened yes. during your interrogation? What did they say? Because you even had a visa, right? I did. I, so I had been um, in Palestine last summer, right at the same time last summer, and uh, I was physically assaulted by a, a settler in, in the uh, city of Hebron. I was there staying uh, with Palestinians, 
and uh, mm -hmm. being part of that community. And so this uh, settler physically assaulted me and soldiers stood by and watched oh. her do that. And um, right. I went on camera during the assault and you can hear me in the video talking to the soldiers and saying, you have an I obligation the video, to, yeah. to protect me and what you're doing here is, is not in accordance with Jewish values. So when I left the country, uh, after all of that, I was there for about six weeks. Um, when I left the country, uh, I was informed by the government that in order to come back, I would have to have a visa in advance. I needed permission in advance from the government. And so right. I got that permission. I got a visa in advance from the Israeli consulate in New York City. And I entered with that visa and boy, were they unhappy that I that I had that visa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they went through quite a wow. process, it seems, to revoke the visa and then deport me from the country. My my interrogation was was quite interesting in the beginning of it, which might be before they fully realized who I was. Because I'm Jewish, the beginning of my interrogation, the first round of it was very friendly. Um, you know, just a, a warm conversation about what synagogue I belong to and um, that I raised my children Jewish and, you know, you have a visa. Yeah. It should just be a few moments. And uh -huh. then it got ugly after that. And it was a period of seven uh -huh. hours altogether. And it was a lot of the same things. They demanded to look at the contacts in my phone and they started going through the contacts looking for Arabic or Muslim names, just disgustingly racist. Um, and then yeah, what the... me, why do you have these names in your phones? Why would you know Palestinians? And I was like, you know, well, because, because I there. <laughs> unlike you, I think that all people are equal and uh, <laughs> appreciate relationships and friendships with all people. Um, <laughs> And they started yelling at me, who do you know in Palestine? Who would you be in contact with? They started yelling at me. So at even me though you gave them your phone and they looked at all your contacts, they still denied you entry. Still denied this makes me, me entry. This makes me so much happier that I did not give them my phone and let them see who I know and who I don't know. It's not and, like I know any dangerous people, but I just don't want any normal Palestinian guys and girls to get into any trouble, which they would because... As we know, the Israeli state likes to make trouble for normal people. They, they, they absolutely like to make trouble. And, you know, so, for example, they, you know, started um, saying, you know, what is this work you've done, you know, with, with Issa Amro, who I've worked with and who we got oh, yeah. advocacy for in Congress. And I said, you yeah, know what, you can, you can look it up. Um, quite proud of my, my work. Wow. And he's supported by Amnesty International. And... Um, they started yelling at me about what happened in Hebron last year. Why would you make our soldiers look bad? Why would you tell them? That... <laughs> well, they are doing a good enough job themselves to make themselves look bad, I think. They don't need exactly anyone exactly what help. I told them. Said, well, you know, it's not me that's making them look bad. It's what they're doing it's that's making them look bad. Their actions, like... Don't film me when I'm harassing people. It makes me look so bad. But maybe you shouldn't harass people in the beginning. What do you think about that? <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, a lot of, like, where are you going to go? Same thing as you. Where are you going to go? Do you have plans to go into the West Bank? You know, why would you be with Palestinians? A lot of that. We know last yeah. summer you spent the time in Hebron with Palestinians. And you're a Jew. You shouldn't be with Palestinians. They so, said you know, that. You're a Jew. You shouldn't be with Palestinians. Which is what the soldiers had told me the previous year in, in, in Hebron. And I think really they pretty much did they said say, Did they say it like that? Or is that just you. the like, gist of it? That's the gist of it. Yeah, just pure, yeah. pure racism. That's pure racism, yeah. You're Jewish, so you shouldn't spend time with Palestinians. And what then, about the Jewish Palestinians? <laughs> what about human rights for all people? Which is what I kept telling them. I'm a nonviolent advocate for human rights for all people. And wow. uh, they would just go on yelling at me. At one point, they yelled at me, Why do you have this visa? Who gave you this visa? And I said, You gave me the visa. Your government gave me the visa. Um, <laughs> which made them unhappy. They uh, yeah. interrogated me about Code Pink, um, my organization, and uh, said, 
um, you know, what is Code Pink? What does it do? And I explained we are an anti-war organization and we oppose militarism and we're Oof, women-led. We do not like anti-war, right? They're not anti-war. They're not into anti-war and peace, unfortunately. Yeah, just, you know, really quite nasty and uh, unpleasant. And then they, after about six hours, they told me you're being denied entry and uh, basically started racing me back to an airplane to send me back to New York. Um, and did, you know, they, did you have to pay for that or did they pay? They paid for that. Um, I would have I liked to have flown over to Jordan and I would have paid for that. But apparently if you're deported from Ben Gurion, they have to send you back to oh. whatever flight you came in on basically. Um, right. and, and, you know, I feel badly. I was planning on spending the summer uh, working with Code Pink's partners on the ground with Coalition right. of Women for Peace, um, an incredible Israeli activist organization that challenges Israeli weapons companies. Yeah, the thing is, they are even and, preventing uh, us from meeting the wonderful Israelis that are working for peace. I mean, they are preventing these contacts between the Israelis that are working actively towards a better world and us who are also trying to do the same. I think they're not so fond of those particular Israelis as well. <laughs> Unfortunately not. <laughs> but they are the heroes working from inside. It's really tough, I can imagine. Absolutely. And Palestinians, you know, in, on the ground are just becoming more and more isolated as more and more people are denied entry. We had um, two leaders from the Center for Constitutional Rights uh, in the U.S. that were denied entry recently. Israel is trying to remove Human Rights Watch from the country so they can't do their work on the ground. It's yeah. just a case of, of strangling um, and isolating Palestinians as and trying to, you know, make them alone in their struggle for freedom and equality. Yeah, with a new law that's being uh, discussed to forbid any photography and videos of soldiers, it just screams that they have everything to hide. I mean, uh, once they expel every single human rights activist, peace activist, human rights organization, and forbid all cameras and videos, then uh, there's no obstacles, right, to carry out more massacres and atrocities, I guess. Absolutely. So uh, before we close out We have to work hard against that. We have today. to be active. <laughs> That's what it's all about as activists. Yes. We have just have to be the counterweight to that because they are working hard. I mean, they make no illusion. They're spending their money and their time investing in making that happen. So we need to work even harder, work smarter, and just invest all our time and energy as much as we can afford to try and be the counterweight because uh, it's not like they're going to give up by themselves and they, they will move with pressure and we are the pressure. I love how you said that. So let's, um, all of us, and, and as a message to our audience. Too, yeah, and it's not just you and pressure. me either. It's everyone watching. It's every person in every country of conscious. It's about uh, us normal people just standing up for our principles. Because even if you say that you have a principle, if you will never act upon it, it's like you never had it in the beginning. We need action. We can't just talk about peace and human rights if we never take action because words fall short of action always. So I want to thank you for taking action and thank you for speaking with us today. And uh, you and I will continue to be in touch and I look forward to meeting you in person. Me too. All the best. And let's meet soon. All the best to you. Thank you so much for your work.